All right, guys, what's going on? Another, uh, excuse me, another episode of the Gospel of Fire, and I am here with Steve Sims. What's up, man? How you doing, buddy? All right, I got a question. This is the question I've been asking everybody since I hired uh, Ease of Mind. I really like them. They've, they've gone out. I've had amazing conversations since uh, I hired this company, Ease of Mind, to go like find people for me so okay. I can stop doing the podcast booking. Why in the world? I, why in the world did you say yes? I'm, I'm not. I don't have a huge podcast. I'm not uh, yet. Yeah, yet. That's fine. But like currently, you said yes, right? So you said yes to you know four thousand listens a month. Why? Um, podcasts are a weird beast. They're very new. They're very. Um, uh, they're very embryonic. And the bottom line of it is they're also evergreen. So when someone, when you've got 30,000 listeners and you're in your fifth year and someone hits subscribe to your podcasts, they're going to get all the back episodes. So they're going to get me in five years time, 10 years time. Now, the bottom line of it is that I've been on a lot of podcasts both, you know, the, the, the big ones, the small ones, the small ones have become big, the big ones have gone pop. So we're still in a very much of a Wild West period of the podcasts, but I'm not on the podcasts for what you're doing today. I'm on the podcast for what you're doing the next decades. Oh. So how many podcasts do you do? Because I mean, that could Oh, you- God. So yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. We actually did check it the other day. Um, I think I'm technically termed as a podcast slut. Um, I think I did three. It was just under 400 I did last year. That's um, more than one a fucking day, bro. It was ridiculous. You know, I was, <laughs> and, and joking aside, today I've got three. So, three. yeah. So I would just like podcast, podcast. And everyone out there at the moment is looking for that angle of marketing. Everyone out there is looking for fake. And I'm talking to any of you out there now that are small businesses. If you've got a story, get your ass on a podcast. Everyone's trying to do Facebook ads and compete with other people. Everyone's trying to do banners and compete with other people. But when you tell your stories, your scars, your crap, the stuff you went through to get you where you are, that's your unique unicorn. That's who you are. That's how you got there. And podcasts, you love this bit, are free of charge Uh to get to speak to a big market of people that listen to you. If I do a Facebook advert, and we won't labor on this, if I do a Facebook advert and you stroll across it by accident and then I've pixeled you and you get bombarded with all my shit for the next 20 years, then you're not a keen observer. You just fell onto it, okay? But you can only hear me if you subscribe to your podcast. So now I've got an engaged listener. I'd rather have 10 engaged listeners than 10 million fake Facebook likes. Yes. A hundred percent. And that's, and that's what podcasting does. Damn right. right. And it lets you, uh, it lets pe- people really get to know you. Like they, yeah. they get to hear who you are rather than, um, the five, the 50 second or 30 second, uh, CNN or MSNBC or Fox news, whichever one you choose to listen to, whichever news program you could go on then that little 30 second blib blurb. Like I'm sure we're both going to say something on this podcast or on a podcast today where uh, if you want to destroy us for the 30 second clip, somebody could do that. But I think people are oh, they probably away. already have. Yeah. They're, they're, <laughs> we're moving away from that and we're starting to listen to uh, long form interviews where you need to be like, all right, hold on. What did that guy really say? Yeah, no, you're right. People we're in a, we're in a world of, of, of intimacy deficiency. And everyone by now is trying to come up on relationships. Tinder's a perfect example of arousement by a fucking picture, okay? (laughs) The bottom line of it is we need to understand, we need to relate, we need to connect. That's the sole reason the Facebook group communities are so popular because the more distracted and pulled away with interaction we get, Believe it or not, we actually yearn to find it in other places. And the podcasts now are typically like the old, the old TV shows. You've got The View and you've got these morning breakfast shows. But in the old days, you used to have those as well. Podcasts are a way of someone being able to eavesdrop and sit in on somebody else's conversation. And we're losing that nowadays. Yeah, but with and and the reason is is like with the View and all these other shows, even even Oprah back in the day and Phil Donahue and all and all these people, they were beholden to a boss. 
Yeah, they were. They were. And, and that's where the internet and, and freedom of speech has been both good and bad. Um, the freedom of speech means that we can say stupid things, inappropriate things, offensive things. Um, but at the same time, we can try to say something. And as you say, people can take a snippet of it and they could take any of the past, I don't know, minute, two minutes that we've been on and find a certain little soundbite in there that makes me sound like a prick. Um, and they wouldn't have to try too hard, but that's the problem with today. But as you say, people are getting tired of that. People yeah. are getting bored of the snippet, uh, the misconception, the inappropriate, the, it wasn't held in context. They want to understand, okay, what does this person stand for? Now, I'm not going to get political, but Trump got in power because he had a clear statement. Love it or hate it, he is the only one that had a banner and you could not look at any of the other candidates and say, well, what did they stand for? Yeah, you could look at Trump and go, build the wall. You knew exactly what was coming. People today want clarity. They want to know what you actually think. Yes, they do. They right? absolutely they do. They want to know what we actually think. And so on the, on the flip side, and I'm not about Trump at all here. Um, on the flip side, though, we crucify people. Right. We, we, oh, we God, yeah. you know, we crucify people because it's like uh, and, and I believe it's because we, we aren't good with ourselves. Right. Like I, I, I just don't understand how people get so mad, how, how people want to agree with 100 percent of what someone thinks like this. This is just beyond me because I don't agree with 100 percent of what anybody thinks, including myself. And I talked about this on my last podcast, too. Like, like, just disagree on some things, but go, oh, you know what? I, I do really agree with that piece. So have you ever heard of the uh, bucket of crabs theory? Uh, talk to me about it. So there's, it's an actual, it's an <coughs> actual uh, thing, a scientific fact or a nature fact, should I say, that you stick a bunch of crabs in a bucket and the first thing they try to do is get out. So they're reaching high, they're reaching up to the top of the lip. Now, the second <coughs> that they climb on each other so the one gets to the top of the lip, rather than that one crab getting stable, the crabs pull it back in because it's moving away from the crowd, moving away from the group. That's what we've got now. The mass um, e economy is doubt, fear, distrust, uh, skepticism that's the most of the human nature we have okay there's a lot the, the reason we revere entrepreneurs is because they're the hogwarts kids they're the ones that are doing magic they're the ones that are getting out there going fuck it i'm gonna do something different yet there's tons and tons and tons and millions and millions of naysayers sitting in our armchair going oh no you can't do that and when you fail the other one's going, <laughs> look at that person. He tried to do so. He should have stayed here with us failures and <clears> screw-ups. <throat> the problem is misery loves misery. And the second that you are successful, that's when it's time to go, ooh, you know, oh, he's got to have some dirty secrets. Oh, we've got, he's got to have earned his position through fraud, through, through being a, 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 de a, a demon, a devil. He's got to have done bad things to where he got to. Because people don't want to believe the hard work still wins. We are, and we all have dirty secrets. I have them. Right? Well, I don't even know if mine are secrets. I'm a uh, serial yeah. fuck up. Um, yeah. I drink too much. <laughs> I don't work out. I cuss like a drunken sailor. Um, I say inappropriate things to my kids because I'm a freaking human being. The yeah. daft thing is, as a human being, <laughs> we are constantly screwing up and... I noticed, I'll, I'll actually, I'll give a name drop here. Um, Elon Musk. Um, Elon Musk said to me, they laugh at you until they applaud. Now, the beautiful thing about Elon Musk is he's a serial failure. He's done tons of things that have failed. And every time they failed, he's then analyzed it to see where did it go wrong. And then the next time, that doesn't fail, but something else does. <clears throat> and he can go, well, okay, I got this far. Where did it go wrong? The thing about Elon Musk is he doesn't give a rat's ass what you think of him. He cares of what he produces and the impact he has. And that's the problem today. We're getting a little bit too soft shell. We're actually concerned what you think of us over the impact we actually have and can create. Where did you think, where do you think that came from? Like where, where did this concern of what people think of you come from? Was it always I, the, 
Was it always there? And now like social media is just like, you know, the light. No, I think it's social media. I think okay. social media has amplified it. You know, we, we're, in a, we're in an economy where there are actually TV shows where if you fall over or walk into a building or bump your head or trip up or fall in the lake, they have shows. Americans' funniest videos are all about people being hurt. The problem is now that in business, we don't want to look stupid. But social amplifies that. If you do, And this is where it gets down to the sound bites again. If you do something that, ah, that didn't work, you've got some prick in Idaho. I'm sorry to pick on Idaho, but yeah, doesn't right. know you, has nothing to do with you that goes, oh, I'm going to take the piss out of him because I'm still doing my shit with a little job collecting, you know, uh, carts at the back of a supermarket. Why should this guy be so rich? And wants to laugh at you. And I think it's social that's given us that double-edged sword. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. It's, you know, and it's, I go so back and forth with it, but social has let us connect with each other too. Like this is social media right now, right? We're talking to each other because of a social media app. Right? Yeah. That, that, that I'm going to share on social media, right? Well, I'm gonna, get- and then I'm going to send it to you and I'm going to ask you to share it as well. Well, this conversation's got dark and it's got dark quick, and I'm pleased about this. But I was having, <laughs> I was having a chat with a, a really good friend of mine, a guy called Dan Fleischman. And I don't know if you've come across Dan. Uh, do you know who Dan is? I don't. Tell me who's Dan. Well, here's the daft thing. Dan Fleischman is the man that runs all the social feeds from everyone from Dan Bezevi into the Kardashians. So he, he runs their social feeds? Yes, he does. If, if, no, if he doesn't know what's going on in the social world, then it's not really going on. Right. Um, and he, he really is the most unknown connected social person out there. Anyone you can think of that's an influencer works with that. That's as simple as that. Now, the problem we've got with social media, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it out, is people can talk a lot of crap. The internet has made a lot of stupid people stupider. And so the problem is you can actually, and I'm here in Hollywood, you can actually go out now jump on the Me Too bandwagon, claim rape, claim um, embezzlement, claim uh, extortion. Cl- you can make those claims, and whether or not you can back it up or not, the damage is done. Now, Dan's got a close friend of his as a, a football player that got accused of rape, lost his career, he committed suicide, and then it turns out that she was a disgruntled former girlfriend that wanted some fame. And I personally met a girl that said to me that she was actually going up soon for the, um, uh, she was registering on a lawsuit for the Me Too campaign. And I said to her, I'm sorry that happened to you. And literally this girl turned around to me and she said, it didn't, but I'll get my fame anywhere I can while here in Hollywood. I just, this I is think, the problem we've got today. Yeah, but do you really think that that's the tr- that that's like the that's the majority of people? I don't I, I can't I don't believe that. The, I I agree that it's the problem. It's Hold on. not the majority of people. It's like the bad cops, right? It, it, like it, correct. it's like the bad cops. Like correct. You're not telling me that. Like I've never I I, I you know like I know, I mean you you probably know some cops. Right. I know a he bunch of cops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're great dudes. They're great dudes. They're great gals. They do a great job. They try their best. You know, they do a terrible job. In fact, we're going to stop now and <laughs> just pay respect to those people that keep me safe. Um, now I ride motorcycles fast and I've got my fair few tickets and I right. know they have to be nasty to me when they have to be nasty to me, but boys and girls of the police force and any of our military out there, I personally say thank you. And I'm on your side. I am too. I am too. It doesn't mean that we don't have some social outcasts. It doesn't mean Correct. that there are some cops out there that um, who have ego problems and power tripping yep. problems yep. and they go into policing or any type of law enforcement so that they can have more power. So I yeah, think you've got I those bad those eggs. Are, yeah. I think those are the outliers. Like, just like, you know, this girl that you're talking about, I think she's yep. an outlier. She yes. gets, she, she can make a, they can all make a lot of fucking noise right now. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's and, the problem. So why do we follow it though? Like, again, why are we fucking listening to it? Well, and, and here's something we're not right. And I would imagine a lot of the people that are listening to your show are not. But a lot of people are, and that's where the downside comes. But here's, here's, this is where it comes down to the, um, the likes versus engagement. A lot of people like to jump on bandwagons. There are people that will jump on a cause just purely for the shit that it's a cause. 
Um, and they have no idea what they're doing, but hey, I wanted to jump around with a banner on a Saturday morning and look woke. You know, there's that community <laughs> out there's that community out there now, but there are those that don't care, that you know, move to the beat of their own drum. A friend of mine, Peter Diamandis, and again, I apologize about jump uh, dropping no, names. Good. Peter Diamandis, um, we were chatting one day and I said something to him about the news. And he said to me, he said, um, I don't watch the news. He said, I do not watch the news. He said, sometimes I'll put it on at like six o'clock in the evening, but I never, never, never watch the news in the morning. And I said to him, I said, well, I find that funny, Peter, because you know, you wake up in the morning, you want to know what's going on, what's gone on, what's happened over the night. He said, no, this is what happens. The news comes on at 7 a.m. in the morning and it starts with good morning and then spends the next two hours telling you why it's not. He said, you get nothing but negativity. The news doesn't come on and say, hey, we found a cure for cancer. We've repaired a kid's eyesight. We've now been able to build a score out, out here. There's none of that. It's, it's if it bleeds, it leads. It's despair, desperation, failure, upset, turmoil. People love panic. And that's what the news is. And then right at the freaking arse end of it for three minutes, they show you about how they saved a kitten from a fucking avalanche. And they expect you to go on your day feeling all motivated because of that bloody kitten. So he doesn't listen to the news. He may, and he says, why should I get negative and down and depressed and then spend the next few hours of my day trying to get out of that to get on with my day? He said, cut it out. Don't watch the news in the morning. And I don't. I have apps that pop up with a, with a, um, a feed. And a headline. I got. Then that's it. I only have BBC. I, I have BBC. I have and uh, I have BBC and I have Daily Mail. Um, okay. And the funny thing about BBC is uh, this is probably what's going to get. This is one of those sound bites everyone's going to bitch at. But I actually hate the American news because they haven't realised there's actually a planet. You know, if it doesn't happen <laughs> in the US, it doesn't happen. So. I want to know about what's going on in Europe. I want to, want, want to know what's going on in the Middle East and in Asia. So I use BBC World News to actually show me what's going on in the world and not just in the 48 states. I just, uh, I had to turn the other ones off. I mean, I used to have them all. I used to have Fox. I used to have CNN. I had yeah. to turn, I had to, when Trump got elected, I had to turn them off because it, it, everything was breaking news right away. And you're like, yo, man, like... It, uh, yeah, I know. He sent out a tweet. I fucking got it. Like, if I want to look at his yeah. tweet, I'll go to Twitter. You're yeah, right. I'll subscribe. Like, yeah, you know, like I, I can do that on my own. I don't need to be fucking bombarded, right, with all this shit. But I want to touch on something that you said. Everyone likes to look woke, but so yeah. few people are. And I talked to somebody the other day. I couldn't believe. I mean, it was it was a really great thing. It's this guy named Andre Norman. Um, I know Andre. Oh, uh, you know Andre? Yeah, my, my boy from prison. Yeah, yeah we both. Man. Yeah, I support the prison projects over here in California, and he's over there on the west coast. But we're both dear. Yeah. East, sorry, east yeah. coast, and we're both dear friends of uh, Joe Polish, probably one of the most dysfunctional wizards out there. <laughs> he said something really cool to me. The, like it was Monday when we were talking, and he goes, "Yeah, man." He goes, "I go to jail on Christmas." Yeah. Right. He goes, I, I don't. He's like, if I, I, I work out my family, like my, you know, like whether we're going to have breakfast or whether we're going to have dinner. He's like, because ev everyone's like, oh, I love you today, every day, but yeah. not on Christmas and not on Thanksgiving and not on these days when I'm with my family and you got to be alone. Like, yeah, like you want to talk about being woke. Yeah. Right? Now we're talking. Right. Like now yeah. we're talking motherfuckers sitting in jail and he, he spent 15 years in jail. Right. He spent yeah, you would think he would want to stay away from that, yeah. you know, but no, that, that, that boy, that boy is just one big solid piece of love. Yeah. Um, and I've got nothing but, but respect for him. I'm in prison. Um, uh, next, uh, Two weeks time. Uh, I don't know when this podcast is. In February, I'm right. in prison. Um, right. And I do it about four times a year. And it was, it was Joe that introduced me to Andre. And we're going to be doing something together. We're going to be going over there onto the East Coast and bringing my tribe over there to, to play, in his, uh, play in his park. Tell me about your tribe. What is your tribe? Like, what is it that you do, man? So what? it was weird. Um, <laughs> this is where I start to stutter. Up until two and a half <laughs> years ago, no one but maybe 300 people in the planet know, knew who I was. Okay. Um, but each one of those people owned things like countries. 
Um, I <laughs> dealt literally with the richest people in the planet. And I'm very well known for sending people down to the Titanic, getting people married, married in the Vatican by the Pope, uh, closing down museums for dinner parties. <laughs> Um, I'm the kind of guy that if you wanted to play on stage with your favorite rock star, you contacted me and I put you on stage with them. You know, I, I was that guy. Um, Forbes and entrepreneur called me the real life wizard of Oz. Um, <laughs> two and a half years ago, they asked me to write a book naming all of the celebrities and rich people that I dealt with. And I knew if I did that, I'd be dead by cocktail hour. Um, but uh, they ended up asking me as a bricklayer from London, would you write a book on how you do it rather than who you do it for? So I went, yeah, sure, fine. I wrote the book, Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. And to be honest with you, we never had a website. We never had any of this stuff because we didn't, we didn't know if it would, you know, anyone would like it. And it took off. Um, it's bestseller all over the place, different countries, audio version. It's just got released um, in... Actually, it's getting released now in Russia, just got released in Japan, Thailand, Vietnam, Mandarin Chinese, and it literally is all over. So now I go around doing a lot of speaking engagements, entrepreneur events. I do a private speakeasy page, um, events, simsdistillery.com is my course. So it's basically launched an entire new chapter of my life where I can confront people, those crabs, and go, hey, if a bricklayer in London, from London, can be doing this with Elon Musk and Richard Branson, then you're already fucked out of excuses. And so I get people uncomfortable. I get to get them to focus on what they can do rather than the sheds they've got in the back of the room or even in the back of their mind. How did you... So you're, you, keep, you brought up a couple times you're a bricklayer from London. Yeah. You started a bricklayer from London. How did you get to blue fishing? What, like, what, was, so, what was that... What was, what, was, what was that journey like? Aggravation. Um, it was like every entrepreneur's journey. Um, I knew I didn't fit. I knew I was different. I knew something wasn't right. And usually that creates frustration and aggravation, and it did. And being a big, ugly lad on a motorbike in East London, aggravated. My, my mum just thought I was going to prison. Um, and I just knew that I didn't want to be a prison. There's got to be something bad for this in my life. Um, but I don't know what it is. Some people at that moment of time would go, well, I'll settle where I am. I, I would literally go to a job in the morning and then quit by lunchtime and go, this isn't for me. It's not challenging me. And my mom would be like, you don't need a job to be challenging. You don't need to be invigorated and inspired. You just need money. Part of that is accurate. But the other part was once challenged, I can make more money. So I started trying to find a way of getting to know rich people and I noticed rich people have this habit that they like to spend money. So if I could find what they wanted and give it to them, I was solving that problem, but more than anything, giving them a reason to talk to me. So I started throwing parties, clubs. I became a party promoter. Then I became a branding and marketing guy. And I ended up working for some of the biggest events in the world. I've, I've been involved with the Grammys, New York Fashion Week, um, Formula One, Polo, art festivals, the art, uh, Basel Art Festival, uh, Elton John's Oscar party, you know, so many different events that I've worked with all over the planet that uh, um, I just want, I wanted a reason for them to be able to communicate to, to and here's the, the, the key, because I wanted to ask them how they got so rich. Without realizing it, I had built up a company and I had actually built up my own future. I built up my own existence and they ended up becoming my clients. So the original reason was I just wanted to find someone rich to walk up to and go, how come you've got so much money? How did you make it? And just like a podcast, and this is the beauty about podcasts, you get to ask those questions without fear of embarrassment. Yeah. You can actually turn around and go, how the fuck you so ugly can you do this without Elton John? And I could go, well, let me answer that there, you know? So that's, that was the reason. I <laughs> wanted a reason. This was back in the 80s. Had it been now, the easiest way for me to talk to someone that's successful would be to do what you're doing now and establish a podcast. Yeah. I, I, look, excuse me. I don't even know that I do it for me so much. I do it for uh, – I do it because I love to talk to people. I believe one of our biggest problems is we don't talk to each other anymore. True. Right? You know, um, we, we, we lead with 
Trump supporter? Yes or no? Right? <laughs> Where do you stand? Like, I need to know all of this shit that, man, has nothing to do with my fucking life. Right? Like, we lead, we lead with whatever thing that might make us disagree, and then we just quadruple down on it. Right? Everyone wants to be successful. Everyone loves to hear how someone did it because then like, I don't know, it just sparks in your mind, right? Like, it oh, does. I might try that. I might try this, right? So man, I'm just trying to throw shit at the wall. I love the talk. Love it. I love to hear uh, people changed and saved my life. So I like to talk to as many people as I can. Man, I made three friends. I've done three pod, uh, no, two. I've done two podcasts this week. I'm about to make, I'm making a third right now. And this is all I'm trying to do is like, be like, yo, what up, man? I want to be able to send you a text and say, yo, how you doing? The good thing about communication, and you can take it one step further, and you actually touched on it earlier, we got, and we were talking about world news. Mm -hmm. I love to argue with people. Okay, I want to, yeah, I, I guess. I like to challenge people's opinions. Now, I'm very fortunate with being, uh, with, with owning the concierge firm that I did and traveling the planet, speaking to clients. I've been in the Middle East. I've been in, in North Asia. I've been in Southeast Asia. I've been uh, in Russia, Poland, Ukraine, Europe, America. I've been in all of these areas, and we don't all agree with each other. And there's nothing better than being able to go and go, well, okay. Why is your position on that so strong? And I want to know that position. Someone asked me in a podcast about two years ago, and it was a really good question. Um, they weren't expecting the answer, but they turned around and they said, oh, live, alive or dead, if you could have dinner with someone, who would it be? And I said, Hitler. And they were like, they were like why the hell would you want to talk to him? And I said, I'd like to ask him what was so terrifying for him that he did what he did. He was trying to create a unified nation of blonde, blue-eyed, perfect German people when he was a short fuck brunette. You know, what was, it just made no sense to me. So I would like to find out what was so scary to him that he went and did the atrocities he did. I wanna know where people's positions are. I love people uh, talking to people on different religions and going, well, okay, um, I don't want to get in too deep because I want to respect you, respect you for that. And I'm not here to argue, <laughs> but I'd like to understand where this came from. Where did this belief? And that can even come down to today. And it's again, the woke community. We had this shit a while ago where everyone was kind of like on the gluten free craze. And then all over LA, people were going, Oh, are you involved in the gluten free diet? And there were these people there going, yes, I am. And they were going, great. What is gluten? Can you, can you tell me what it looks like? You know, can you tell me where to find it? You know, and they would hold up pictures and they were like Jimmy Kimmel doing these funny little gags going, is this gluten? Is this gluten? And people are like, well, I, I, I don't really know, but I, you know, people are like that now. We try to jump on bandwagons way too fast without letting knowledge get in the way. Dude, Jesus and Hitler are my top two. Oh, people yeah, are, yeah. you know, I want to talk. Can to you Jesus. imagine that? Can you imagine right. a fucking barbecue with that? Right. You know, Fuck. That just that would be, yeah, yeah that, that would be pretty good. And my, <laughs> my grandparents are Holocaust surviving Jews, right? So I went to, yeah, I did, uh, I did, uh, um, I can't say I did, but I went to uh, Auschwitz a couple of years ago and I was working for a very powerful man in Poland. And uh, literally, I had turned up and he contacted me when I was in Poland. I traveled from L.A. to Poland to see him. And when I landed in my hotel in Poland that, you know, he had covered, there was a note there saying, I'm on business. I'll be there in a couple of days. I've extended your stay. And I'm like, oh, so I had a few days in Poland. And, you know, I didn't know what to do in Krakow. I actually went down to Auschwitz and Birkenau. And you can't go to places like that without without feeling the, 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 the gravity of the situation. But there's a picture that I've never been able to get out of my mind. And the place is full of photographs. But there's these Nazis leading the Jewish people out of the ghettos onto the trains. And they've convinced the, they've convinced the Jewish people that they're going to a better life. And there's a Nazi actually holding a little, little girl's hand, taking her to, and she's skipping. Because she's so happy that they're getting out of the ghetto to a better life. The, the, the atrocity of it, I can't comprehend. Even, even after I was there, 
But I really can't understand the depth of passion that Hitler had that he felt that what he was doing was right. And I'd really like to question that. So I'll tell a personal story <laughs> that is similar to the one you just told. Um, so my grandmother was in the camps with, uh, you know, they separate men and women. Yeah. Right. So she's with her mother and her older sister and her younger sister. So there's four of them. And my grandmother at the time was 18, somewhere in there. You know, like they don't, it's really interesting. They don't remember how, like they, ne they never knew exactly when anything happened. Like they can't tell you a date because their no. mind was so stuck on survival that, or how old they were, any of that, that's gone. They, they remember the memory, you know, so that it's, that was a, that was a very interesting thing talking to them. Like, when did this happen? How old were you? And they could never say when, because it, like that, that was so unimportant. Um, and her littlest youngest sister was, a, you know, around 11, somewhere in there, 12, you know, and they were taking this group of women to, from one camp to another. And they were making the adults walk and they were putting all the kids on the train. And they were like, look, the kids aren't going to make it through the mountain right or through the through the thing and they put the kids on the like and, and my fam and my family my grandmother their their youngest sister was right along the edge there of like maybe she can make it and maybe she won't she's not quite a kid right like she's 12 maybe she can get through this you know and like the last thing you ever wanted to do was separate because if you separated that could be it and you know collectively they decided to put her on the train to make it easier for her and man, they saw the train blow up. You know, they just saw the train explode and they're like, you know, and, and now like they got to, they got to walk, they, you know, and the Nazis are like, okay, you're walking and you can't really cry and you can't really mourn. You got to walk because if you don't walk, you're going to, you're going to, you're, you're dying, you know? So yeah, I want to know too, <laughs> like, you know, what, what she's 12, man, yeah. right? She was, you know, she's 12. Why did you do that? There's a lot of stupid stuff that went on and yeah. there's a lot of ignorance. And I think bringing it back to today's day, um, if we stop communicating, then we are opening ourselves up to making those mistakes again. Um, I want, and this is going to sound horrible and um, you, you want to throw shit at me, boys, you can find me on stevedsims.com. You can find <laughs> me all over Instagram. Come and find me and shout and state your case. I don't give a fuck. But while we are so terrified to say what we think, we're also terrified to stand up for things that actually bother us. But it makes me, it makes me boil when I see people videoing on their phones someone else getting beaten up. Why don't you fucking get, put your phone down and get in there and stop it? But the second, I, I honestly want to see a law come in that if you are videoing something going on and i'm on about you know when you're in in the crowd i'm not on about when right. you're in a window and you're looking at something wrong going outside the window and you're terrified but you got the number plate i'm right. not on about that but i'm on about the, the pricks that have stood around someone getting hurt someone getting tormented or laughed at and you're videoing it i actually want to start seeing and i also want that to go further and to be finding the people that are posting that shit look i'm okay like if you and i want to fight like we have beef, let's say, right? Like school yeah. kids on the playground. We're going to fight. Okay, you're yeah, going to yeah. fight. If somebody videos that, I don't fucking care, right? Like whatever, I, you know, like that doesn't bother me. But like the attacking of somebody. Yeah. Right? Or okay, once the fight's over, look, I'm all for a fair fight. We should fight. We should let our kids fight. Like right now, like my, my youngest kid, uh, this kid, this kid at his school is a bully. Like a full on bully. He doesn't bully him anymore, but he'll push him a little bit. And then my other kid will like, my kid will look at him and he goes, okay, sorry, sorry. You know? And I was like, Hey, that, and I told him last week, I was like, yo, that's enough. You've, t you've, you've given him warnings, right? You've given him plenty of warnings. You put that motherfucker on the ground. And I didn't say, I didn't tell him to call the kid a motherfucker. Yeah. Right? I was like, you double leg that kid. You put him down, you get on top and you ask him, you're like, are you done? Or are you not done? And if he says he's not done, smack him in the face. Yep. Right. And then after you smack him in the face, when he says he's done, you go and get the teacher. Like, I'm all for this. This is fine. We need to let our kids fight it, and, and learn how to handle it. We step in in every fucking situation, you know? But what I'm not, I, I agree with you. But once the fight's over and people are videoing, somebody getting their face stomped on, it's like, yo, dude, what are you doing? What, go stop that shit. 
There's weird people around. You're completely right. And again, in your conversation there, there's one word that, that you're, you're saying without verbalizing it, respect. Mm -hmm. We are losing a lot of respect for each other and we're becoming into this invincibility complex. You see this, you see this situation arising now and we're going back full circle now to the police. Um, you're getting kids now to think that they can't be told off as long as they're being videoed. And so what do the kids do in front of the authorities? They just front up and they go, yeah, yeah, well, you can't just, my freedom of speech stuff. We're seeing all these things. And again, we're seeing these little breakdowns. I saw someone, and I live in LA, all right? So every night, sadly, it's about a shooting, a mugging, you know, a right. And then what happens is you get this guy. There was one on TV. There was this guy with a knife. Now, the policeman had shot the kid, and um, he, was, he was killed. Um, and then the whole family and the whole community are police brutality, blah, 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 blah. And it all kicked off. Okay. And then it came out when they released the cam, the police officers now need to have support. They need to have backup with these cameras. They released the camera footage and they were showing pictures on the news weeks before of this like 11 year old kid. You know, little innocent child. Why was he shot? It was a fucking picture of when he was 11. Most people at 11 are innocent. This kid was like 18 or 19 years old. Now he had tats all up his face and was trying to stab the police officer. And as a last resort, the police officer shot him. But they were showing all the pictures of the innocent. The stories are out of context now. The respect is gone. We need to get back into the single thing to let to communicate. If you've got an argument with each other, be free to argue, get your opinions out. But let's stop being scared of actually saying things and stop getting on the bandwagon when you really don't know what you're talking about. Look, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't know what that police story is that you just said, right? Like, I, I didn't hear it, you know? And, and I can't argue it, right? But for some reason, we, we like to attach to one thing somebody says and go, oh, no, no I disagree with that point. So the, the whole story must be wrong, you know? Yeah. And like, look, I am a fan, you know, Jocko Wilnick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm a fan of what he, what he preaches, extreme ownership. Yes. Right? Extreme yes. ownership. Everything in your life is your fault. Yep. Everything, every single thing. Now, you know, if you answer correctly in every situation, like let's just use the police situation. It makes it so much easier for everyone. Look, man, like my wife and I differ. She's a fucking asshole when she gets pulled over. She argues and like, I'm like, yo, baby, I'm a fucking black Jew and I'm in the car with you. What are you doing? <laughs> Shut the fuck up, you blonde haired, blue eyed white girl. Shut the fuck up. Like you, you know, like because everyone needs to act correctly. A cop yeah. pulls you over, right? Your hands go to 10 and 2. Right. Yep. And that you get like, look, let's say you, you are dealing with the most racist, the most piece of shit cop there is in the whole world. Shut the fuck up. Ten and two. Do what he says after you're safe, after you've owned your owned your shit, then you can start to like make make a case if that's you're right. But don't do it in the situation because that shit's just going to escalate. Right. And it's going to escalate fast because fast. They, the police don't know what they're walking up to. Um, and how many times have we now seen videos where there's a gun in there and it suddenly starts shooting the poor cop that actually walked up to the door? They have no idea what they're walking up to. I, I believe the policing problem, right? I really believe the policing problem. And I don't know that I, because uh, I, I see both ends of that spectrum, right? They, they, yep. they assume there's the gun and then, they're, and, and then they don't assume there's the gun. I believe that better training for our police officers, starting with better hand-to-hand -hand combat training with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, because I'm a martial artist, right? I do right. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? I believe if every cop, if every cop has to spend five years <laughs> and, and really learn how to fight, physically fight with these, right? And your body, you'll do so much better. We will do so much better because, man, let me tell you, you could walk up to me and you could say anything you want. The last thing I'm going to do is fight you. The yeah. very last thing I'm going to do, because I know what fights look like, right? I, you know, I, trained, I trained with my students last night and I'm the teacher. I'm the biggest one in the room. And you know what? I made a fucking mistake and I got beat. I got beat by somebody <laughs> who's not better than me. 
right? Just in the training room, shit happens. So I'll avoid every single thing to get into a fight. So how old are you though? I'm 40 almost. I'm 30. I think that happens. I was, look, I'm an Irish kid from East London. Okay. So Friday nights were for fighting. Yeah. Um, and I got my ass whipped not once, but every fight. Uh, I was this big, because I was such a big lad, it was all the little shits that would pick on me to try and earn their stripes by picking on the big guy. And I would flail around like, a, like an idiot, like a windmill, and I would always get my ass whipped. And I had enough, and I joined this kickboxing team because quite simply, I wanted to kick the kids in on a Friday, a Friday night. And I started training, and I started working out, and I got better and better and better. And then I noticed... I was working out three times a week, kickboxing, and I had never fought on a Friday night. The more I knew how to fight, the less I fought. And you'd see these guys walk into the bar, and I'd, I'd see it, and I'd be like, oh, he picked on me a couple of years ago. And I would kind of just lean around thinking, oh, he's going to come for me because he wants his stripes. And he'd look at me and nod and walk past. Because like you were saying with your boy, no one wants to fight, but there's a difference between uh, not wanting a fight, but being prepared to fight. And that's the And if you are prepared, nine times out of 10, it doesn't actually come. It doesn't I'm, happen. I'm doesn't 53 happen. years old now, and I've had arguments with people, and it's been heated. And I've had people around me going, well, I thought he was going to start fighting. I was like, there was no need. You know, the, the, the fighting is when the conversation's over, over, when, you know, all of that's gone. And, it's, it's a strange scenario, but yeah, the more you learn how to fight, the less you do. And that's also relevant in your business world. As an entrepreneur, the more mistakes you've made and learned from, the more educated you become as an entrepreneur, the less the mistakes come along. You very rarely you know, trip on the same curve twice. And then for me, right, because I, I, I'm going to talk about the fighting and then the entrepreneur thing. Uh, for me, with the fighting thing, like, look, I'm a 250-pound fucking dude. You know, yeah. I'm a big guy. Every, like, male to male, people look at me, and, and like, we, like, there's, that's just how we are, right? We have this interaction, like, okay, I better watch what I say because I don't want to fight that guy, right? It, 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 most of, or they're like, okay, I'm going to fucking show this motherfucker who I am. Like, <laughs> you get one of those two yeah, scenarios, do, yeah. right? So, for me, it's knowing how to fight and being aware of this dynamic. I'm now really working on how to talk and have conversations in a, yeah. non, in a non-violent way, right? That doesn't bring out the emotion of challenging anybody, right? So knowing how to fight has now uh, um, allowed me to talk to people differently. So this whole like, I'm gonna show him or oh shit, he might fuck me up, whichever, wherever they fall on the spectrum. So that goes out of the picture because I don't wanna start with fear, right? No, I don't wanna true. start with fear. I wanna start with love, you know? And if you can see that I love you, you know, and I'm going to talk to you in a skillful way where I love you. Now, maybe we can have a real conversation. And we can get to some shit rather than this ego battle that so many of us have, you know? Yeah, it's true. It is true. So, I, I mean, I read a great book, Nonviolent Communication. And at, at, uh, at first, I fucking hated it because he's talking about feelings, right? And I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> this is going to be some hippie fucking like new age, like fuck off, man. And then like he gets done the feelings chapter and he goes into something else. He goes, I want you to understand something. Your feelings are hundred percent up to you. Don't put that shit on anybody else. Another good book and another guy, a good guy to listen to. It's probably one of the scariest fuckers in the planet and was actually deemed as a lethal weapon in the UK is uh, Tim Larkin. Have you come across him yet? Tim Larkin? Tim Larkin, L-A-R-K-I-N. Tim Larkin did uh, a book, When Violence is the Answer. He literally trains people all around the world on how to do the final maneuver. Now, it's not a kind of a choke out. They're all kill moves. What, what two moves do you need to do to kill someone? Um, okay. And, what, you know, former SEAL, all that kind of stuff. Big ass guy. Same kind of thing. I think he's maybe, you know, 250 pounds. I'm 200. I think I'm 230. Um, but he's taller, bigger, stronger than me. Um, but as usual... One of the nicest, most articulate, polite guys you get because they don't need that. And you're right. He said, and his words, I talk to everyone as though they've got the finger on a trigger. He said, I don't want to be the cause that's going to make them pull that trigger. Um, now, that trigger could be putting them in a bad mood for the day. You know, it hasn't got, to be, yeah. hasn't got to be violence, but you don't want to be the conduit 
to them getting in a bad way. So if you treat people, and again, we're going to go back to one word that we're using here. If you use your communication to extend respect for someone else, do you walk through the pub and you nudge someone, you spill that beer and the guy's smaller than you and he's with you with a date and you just turn them out. It costs nothing to just go, I am so sorry. Can I please buy you a beer? I apologize about that. You know, it's a busy bar. I didn't mean, it's just respect. It doesn't lower you. It doesn't humiliate you, but it's just respect. I, I, again, I think, uh, I think where we're, we're going to go back to social media here. I think part of the problem that we, where we lose it is so many people are communicating on social media, you know, and they're not looking at each other in the face. They're not looking yeah, at no, each other in the I'm going to argue with you now. They're not. They're not communicating yeah. on social media. On social media, I'm showing you how big my dick is compared to yours. On social media, it's very much a combative sport. I'm saying a like. They hit a like, and that's how they're communicating. Or they give like a knuckles on Yeah, a it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shout-out kind of scenario. Yeah. It's, a, it's a, I'm going to shout out something to you. If you agree with it, acknowledge it in some format, but it's not a true – communication no, is two no. people doing what we're doing now. Look, I changed my podcast like uh, three months ago. To, I used to only do audio. And yep. then I was like, you know what, man? I did like, I, I was like, man, I really just enjoy sitting with people more. And I'm not, I'm not Joe Rogan yet. Right. Where no one's flying into my house to like <laughs> fucking sit in a, in a fucking studio with me for an hour, you know? So I was like, I got to figure out a way to zoom. Right. I have to look at the person. They have to look at me, you know? And I, and I didn't, ha I didn't even have the video thing figured out at first, you know, like, but I, I'm kind of tech idiot, but I, I, you know, I'm getting there. And I would just record the audio, but we would look at each other, right? Yeah. And, I, and the conversations just went better because we're looking at each other. Like, I see your face, you see my face. You know? A lot more is communicated yeah. in visual um, that people don't realize, you know? And that's the problem with email as well. Uh, you send someone an email, they don't know the tone that it was sent. Right. Worse, you don't know the tone or mood that the person's in that's reading it. If when I they read you, it. Yeah. yeah, if I send you an email and I say something like, um, uh, let's do drinks tomorrow, 7 p.m., if you're having a really bad day, you're going to take that as authoritative. You're going to take that as demanding. And you're going to be like, well, fucking should I do that? But if I send you a video text going, dude, we haven't spoke for ages. Be it tomorrow, 7 p.m. All that enthusiasm, all of that light in my eye, all of that passion. You're like, I know what he wants. It's harder to confuse when you've got face-to-face -face communication. Yeah. Way harder, you know, way harder. And then I'm trying, I've been my, 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 the CEO of my company, uh, he get, he, I, he stole it from somebody, you know, we all say nothing's, nothing's original. Everyone steals, right? Like, Oh he, yeah. He, uh, he was like, look, man, when you are in that situation where somebody is annoying you and who don't even worry why sometimes, but you're in the situation, they're annoying you. Just ask yourself a question, ignorance or malice, right? Yep. Right. Yep. Ignorance or malice, you know? Uh, so which one is it? Which one is it? You know, and, and I, I almost always fall on ignorance and they're not trying to kill me. Yeah, because you, you've got confidence. Uh, you've got confidence, not in your ability to fight, but you're in your ability to communicate. Um, and that's the problem now. You know, a lot of people now, it's, the, the daft thing is you will send your kids to martial arts training. Okay. But you won't, you won't send them to like a, um, a negotiation school or you won't send them to a debate team. If I said to my boy, hey, I'm going to send you to a debate team, they'd be like, piss off, dad. That's, that's <laughs> woofy. You know, I'm not doing that. But his ability to negotiate. Now, my son was an engineer um, and he left engineering and he came to me and he went, I don't know how I'm going to get in it. Trouble is, kids now are being asked at the age of 19, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? I'm 53. I don't know what I want to do tomorrow, you know? So they're being asked, and he said, I, and I said, look, there's some basic skill sets you've got to know. One of them is communication. Start communicating. And he was like, well, that sounds daft. And he started hanging around with me and coming to different things. And I'm not getting the shit that I'm done because I've got more money than anyone else or I'm better looking than anyone else or I went to Harvard or I'm related to the queen. I'm getting the shit that I want done because I'm able to communicate uh, my reasoning, my point, my goal in a manner that values your time and helps you as well. So the art of communication 
is the single skill set we need to be focusing on. I 100% agree, man. And uh, man, we're getting close here. So I, I just wanted to say, I, I really appreciate it, you know? And I think this is just an example. Uh, like, uh, and what I'll say is, I don't know that we agree fully on the police issue. And I don't know what other issues that we might agree or disagree on, but that's okay. Right? Yeah, it is. Like, that's it okay. Is. We're allowed to disagree and we're allowed to still have an hour long, really nice conversation and, and like each other and hopefully communicate in the future. Right? Yep. Like, and just, you know, like, are, are we going to be best friends? Who fucking knows? Maybe it will blossom into that. Most likely not, but it's okay. You don't need a fucking BFF every time you say hello to somebody and, <laughs> and, and become a friend. Uh, that, that's a, that's a great, that's a great, uh, monologue there. Well done, pal. Yeah, man. Tell everyone where they can reach you, bro. So I'm on stevedsims.com, which is just one M. Um, you can find my ass all over social on Steve D Sims. I've got a Facebook group called an entrepreneur's advantage with Steve Sims, where, you know, I try to give any tidbits. I actually talk a lot about my failings in this Facebook page because yeah. I, I think people need to be aware that, you know, the, the, the grass, you know, I wish my life was as good as it looks on Facebook, but it's not. Um, <laughs> and I'm constantly making mistakes, constantly failing. Um, I've got a company I'm closing down at the moment because it's just not making any money. People need to be aware that shit happens. And so right. that's where I uh, unload all the time there. Cool, man. All right, man. Uh, I'm going to end this real fast and then I'll, I'll stop the recording and we can exchange information and stuff. And then, uh, man, I'd love to stay in contact. So cheers, um, pal. All right, guys, that is the episode. I hope you all enjoyed uh, Steve Sims. Go reach out to him. And you guys know how I close this shit every fucking day, guys. Go out there and find your power, not someone else's power. Don't be like somebody else. Find your very unique, not special. You're not special. Your mommy lied to you, right? Go find your very unique power and enjoy your life.